Welcome, billionaireette. Hello, how you doing? I am yours truly, Isabel Bedell, and I'm here to read you chapter two of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. This has been the first financial freedom book selected to read out loud. So I'm so, so excited to enter chapter two with you. Um, We're diving deep into this entire book. And the really, really cool part about this is that not only will you get the reading out loud version, but you can also go into the billionaire inner circle where we actually dive deeper, get the cliff notes, get the summaries, get the inside scoop of what's really happening. That way you can really just take your knowledge to the next level because it's it's one thing to hear it once, twice, maybe three times. I mean, this is probably like our third time reading this book, you know? But every time you read, it just sinks deeper. Every time that you discuss it with someone, it sinks deeper. When you're able to share your knowledge with others, now you're being held accountable. So make sure to check out the description below. The Billionaire Inner Circle, that's where it's at. And if you are looking for personal and financial freedom for 2022, make sure to check it out. Cheers to you. This is our Billionaire uh, mug. So before I dive into this, make sure to grab a cup of tea. I love mint tea. So if you want to join me, my mint tea, you know, lovers. Pictures. Mm. So good. Awesome. So let's dive into this. Super excited. <clears throat> so, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Chapter 2. Awesome. Why teach financial literacy? It's not how much money you make, it's how much money you keep. In 1990, Mike took over his father's empire and is, in fact, doing a better job than his dad did. We see each other once or twice a year on, a, on the golf course. He and his wife are wealthier than you could imagine. Rich dad's empire is in great hands, and Mike is, growing, is now grooming his son to take his place as his dad groomed us. In 1994, I retired. I was 47 and my my wife, Kim, was 37. Retirement does not mean not working. For us, it means that bearing overseen cataclysmic changes, we can make work or not work and our wealth grows automatically, staying ahead of inflation. Our assets are (coughs) are large enough to grow by themselves. It's like planting a tree. You water it for years, and then one day it doesn't need you anymore. Its roots are implanted deep enough that that tree provides shade for your enjoyment. Mike chose to run the empire, and I chose to retire. Whoever I speak to, whenever I speak to groups of people, they often ask what I would recommend they do. How do I get started? Is there a book you re- you would recommend? What should I do to prepare my children? What is your secret to success? How do I make millions? Whenever I hear one of those questions, I'm reminded of the following. The richest businessman. In 1923, a group of the greatest leaders and richest businessmen men held a meeting at the Edgewater Beach Hotel in Chicago. Among them were Charles Schwab, head of the largest independent steel company, Samuel Insel, president of the world's largest utility, Howard Hobson, head of the largest gas company, Ivar Kruger, president of the International Match Co., one of the world's largest companies at the time, Leon Frazier, president of the Bank of International Settlements, Richard Whitney, president of the New York Stock Exchange, Arthur Cotton, and Jesse Livermore, two of the biggest stock speculators, and Albert Fall, a member of the President Harding Cabinet. 25 years later, nine of those titans ended their lives as follows. Schwab, 
died penniless after living for five years on borrowed money. Insul died broke in a foreign land, and Kruger and Cotton also died broke. Hobson went insane. Whitney and Albert Fall were released from prison, and Fraser and Livermore committed suicide. Eesh. I doubt if anyone can say what really happened to these men. If you if you look at the day, 1923, it was just before the 1929 market crash in the Great Depression, which I suspect had a great impact on these men in their lives. The point is this. Today we live in times of greater and faster change than these men did. I suspect there will be many booms and busts in the coming years that will parallel the ups and downs these men faced. I am concerned that too many people are too focused on money and not on their greatest wealth, their education. If people are prepared to be flexible, keep an open mind and learn, they will grow richer and richer despite tough changes. If they think money will solve problems, they will have a rough ride. Intelligence solves problems and produces money. Money without financial intelligence is money soon gone. Most people fail to realize that in life, it's not how much money you make, it's how much money you keep. We've all heard those stories of lottery winners who are poor, then suddenly rich, and then poor again. They win millions, yet are soon back to where they started. Or stories of professional athletes who at the age of 24 are earning millions, but are sleeping on their bridge 10 years later. I remember a story of a young basketball player who a year ago had millions. Today, at just 29, he claims his friends, attorney, and accountant took his money, and he was forced to work at a car wash for minimum wage. He was far from the car wash because he refused to take off his championship ring as he was wiping off the cars. His story made national news, and he is appealing his termination, claiming hardship and discrimination. He claims that the ring is all he has left, and if it was stripped away, he'll crumble. That's sad. I know so many people who who became instant millionaires. And while I am glad some people have become richer and richer, I caution them in the long run. It's not how much money you make, it's how much money you keep and for how many generations you keep it. So when people ask, where do I get started? Or they tell me, how do I get rich quick? They often are greatly disappointed with my answer. I simply say to them that, what my rich dad said to me when I was a little kid. If you want to be rich, you need to be financially literate. The idea was drummed into my head every time we were together. As I said, my educated dad stressed the importance of reading books, while my rich dad stressed the need to master financial literacy. If you're going to build an empire, state building, <clears throat> the first thing you need to do is dig a big deep hole and pour a strong foundation. If you're going to build a home in the suburbs, all you need to do is pour a six inch slab of concrete. Most people in their drive to get rich are trying to build an empire state building on a six inch slab. Our school system created in a gradient, agrarian age still believes in homes with no foundation. Dirt floors are still the rage. So kids graduate from school with virtually no financial foundation. One day, sleepless and deep in debt in suburbia, living the American dream, they decide that the answer to their financial problems is to find a way to get rich quick. Construction on the skyscraper begins. It goes up quickly, and soon, instead of the Empire State Building, we have the Leaning Tower of Suburbia, the sleepless night's return. As for Mike and me in our adult years, both of our choices were possible because we were taught to pour a strong financial foundation when we were just kids. Accounting is 
possibly the most confusing, boring subject in the world. But if you want to be rich long term, it could be the most important subject. For Rich Dad, the question was how to take boring and confusing subjects and teach it to kids. The answer he found was to make it simple by teaching it in pictures. My Rich Dad poured a strong financial foundation for Mike and me. Since we were just kids, he created a simple way to teach us. For years, he only drew pictures and he used few words. Mike and I understood the simple drawings, the jargon, the movement of money. And then in later years, Rich Dad began adding numbers. Today, Mike has gone on to master much more complex and sophisticated accounting analysis because he had to in order to run his empire. I am not sophisticated because my empire is smaller, yet we come from the same simple foundation. Over the following pages, I offer you the same simple line and drawings Mike's dad created for us. Though basic, those drawings helped guide two little boys in, in building great sums of wealth on a solid and deep foundation. Rule number one. You must know the difference between an asset and a liability. And buy assets. If you want to be rich, this is all you need to know. It is rule number one. It is the only rule. This may sound absurdly simple, but most people have no idea how, to, how profound this rule is. Most people struggle financially because they do not know the difference between an asset and a liability. Rich people acquire assets. The poor and middle class acquire liabilities that they think are assets said Rich Dad. When Rich Dad explained this to Mike and me, we thought he was just kidding. Here we were, nearly teenagers and waiting for the secret to get rich. And this was his answer. It was so simple that we stopped for a long time to think about it. What is an asset? Asked Mike. Don't worry right now, said Rich Dad. Just let the idea sink in. If you can comprehend the simplicity, your life will have a plan and be financially easy. It is simple. That is why the idea is missed. You mean all we need to know is what an asset is? Acquire them and we'll be rich? I asked. Rich Dad nodded his said, yep, it's that simple. If, if it's that simple, how come everyone's not rich i asked rich dad smiled because people do not know the difference between an asset and a liability i remember asking how could adults be so misguided if it's so simple like and so important why would everyone not want to find out i took rich dad on it took rich dad only a few minutes to explain what assets and liabilities were as an adult, I have difficulty explaining it to adults. The simplicity of the idea escapes them because they have been educated differently. They were taught by other educated professionals such as bankers, accountants, real estate agents, financial planners, and so forth. The difficulty comes in asking adults to unlearn or become children again. An intelligent adult often feels it is demeaning to pay attention to simplistic definitions. Rich Dad believed in the KISS principle. Keep it simple, stupid, or keep it super simple. So he kept it simple for us, and that made our financial foundation super strong. So what causes the confusion? How could something so simple be so screwed up? Why would someone buy an asset that was really a liability? The answer is found in basic education. We, fa we focus on the word literacy and not financial literacy. What defines something to be an asset or liability are not words. In fact, if you really want to be focused, look up the words asset and liability in the dictionary. 
I know the definition may sound good to a, a trained accountant, but for the average person, it makes no sense. But we adults are often too proud to admit that something does not make sense. To us young boys, Rich Dad said, what defines an asset are not words, but numbers. And if you can't read the numbers, you can't tell an asset from a hole in the ground or in the accounting room. In accounting, Rich Dad would say, it's not the numbers, but the numbers, but what the numbers are telling you. It's just like words. It's not the words, but the story the words are telling you. If you want to be rich, you have to read and understand numbers. If I heard that once, I heard it a thousand times from my rich dad. And I also heard the rich acquire assets and the poor in the middle class acquire liabilities. Here is how to tell the difference between an asset and a liability. Most accountants and financial professionals do not agree with the definitions, but these simple drawings were the strong were the start of a strong financial foundations for us. So this is very important right here. If you can't read the numbers, you can't tell an asset from a hole in the ground. In accounting, Rich Dad would say, it's not the numbers, but what the numbers are telling you. It's just like words. It's not the words, but the story the words are telling you. So strong. And he has this awesome uh, picture here that you can take a look at. Really, really awesome. You can pause here and take a look, but it's basically two boxes up top. It has the income statement and then a balance sheet and the assets with an arrow pointing up into the income. This is the cash flow pattern of an asset. So that's what he's pretty much sharing on this page. The top part of the diagram is an income statement, often called a profit and loss statement. It measures income and expenses, money in and money out.